I'm going to start, <laughs> I'm going to start <laughs> at verse 12, and I'm going to read to verse 20, and, and I will be serious, I promise you. I think. Um, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who, walk, who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We're going to be looking at that a little more in a moment, even though I stopped there last time we were together. But he goes on into verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. And so, as we review, just bringing you up to where we've been and using verse 12 as a foundation as we move into the rest of the verses tonight. I've already mentioned to you that the Gospel of John, within the Gospel of John, Jesus made seven, what are called seven I am statements. Seven I am statements. And we've already looked at John 6, 35, where he said, I am the bread of life. And verse 12 here gave us a second, what is called a second I am statement, where it says, uh, I am the light of the world. Now, we're going to use that as our foundation or our, our, um, where we begin, because we need to remember that in the Old Testament, when he speaks concerning being the light of the world, in the Old Testament, The prophets used the symbol of light very often to represent Messiah. You can see this, for example, in Isaiah, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2. Because in Isaiah 9, verse 2, it reads, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And that was a a scripture in Isaiah that would speak concerning the one who was to come, the Messiah. We know that because Matthew quoted that passage when he presented Jesus as Messiah. If you take notes, Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 through 17 reads, Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Matthew took Isaiah's prophecy and applied it to Jesus as Messiah because the prophets used the symbol of light to represent Messiah. And so that means that the scribes and the Pharisees would understand what Jesus was saying. They would know that he was claiming to be the uh, Messiah of Israel. And that's what causes them to respond in the way that they do. Now, Jesus had, and I mentioned this before, but I'm using this again as our foundation. Jesus had had made it clear that humanity basically is divided into two categories, those who walk in spiritual darkness and those who walk in spiritual light. And so when you see the the phrase walking in darkness, as mentioned before, walking in darkness speaks of those who are lost. It speaks of living a life that is enslaved to sin, walking in darkness. Sin is a way of life. Now, this is something that the Apostle Paul gives us insight into, And if you'd like for a moment to uh, keep your place in John, but turn to Ephesians chapter 4, I want to show you something. Ephesians chapter 4, I want to develop my introduction of this passage by turning you to Ephesians 4 and looking at verses 17 through 19 
so that we can see how Paul spoke concerning walking in the dark. Because Jesus has just said that we would not walk in darkness, but would have the light of life. And as I mentioned, walking in darkness is another way of saying uh, that we live in sin as a way of life, a habitual way of life. Not that we that uh, people who are saved don't sin, but we don't continue in sin. That isn't our way of life. Yes, we fail. Yes, we fall. But it is not our continual way of life. But the person who is unsaved, their continual way of life is walking in darkness. And Paul speaks of that here in Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. Paul writes, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. So he's describing the walk of darkness. And he actually gives four characteristics of somebody who walks in darkness. He says that they live in an imaginary world. He says they lack knowledge of God's truth. He said they are spiritually and morally calloused. And then finally, he says they have voluntarily embraced a life without moral restraint. And so with that in mind, Paul was exhorting the church not to, as he was saying, not to walk as the Gentiles who walk in darkness. In other words, believers, Christians, are not to live like those who do not know God. And I want to develop that. Notice verse 17. I'll spend a few minutes looking at it. He says in verse 17 that they are to no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, he said, in the futility of their mind. The word futility speaks of that which is devoid of truth or that which is appropriate. In other words, those who do not know God live in in, live in an imaginary world that lacks purpose and hope. Look around you, and you can see that in the society that we live in. They live in an imaginary world, Paul said, the futility of a mind. They live in, with futility. They don't have a, a truthfulness within them. They live in an imaginary world, and, and that results in a lack of purpose. It results in a lack of, of, of true hope. It's a life that, that the writer uh, of Ecclesiastes would call a life of vanity. In Ecclesiastes 1.14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. Indeed, all is vanity, grasping for the wind. And that is how people who don't know Christ live, with futility in an imaginary world. They don't have something that is true and solid, substantive. The person who doesn't know the Lord doesn't walk in realities, the point he's making. And we see that very clearly today. In verse 18, he speaks of them having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. So a second thing is because they live in futility, they are without knowledge of the truth. Now that speaks of a willful hardening a surrendering to darkness. It, it speaks of those who desire to remain in sin. And there are those who, who can't imagine a life other than the one that they already have. I, I read a, a book once about, uh, it had an illustration in it about a, a rabbit that was kept in a cage. It was one of those Goliath rabbits. Some of you have seen those before. They're, they're huge. They call them Goliath for a reason. They're giant rabbits. And this guy had it as a, a small bunny, had it in a cage. But the rabbit it was a massive rabbit, and it actually grew so large that its body took the whole cage. And so it was just there. His little nose was just pressed against the, the cage door. And the guy felt pity for this rabbit, so he took the rabbit and he went into a into the woods where rabbits live naturally and opened up the cage door to let the rabbit out. And I remember as I read this book how, how he described the rabbit sniffing the air and then finally squeezing itself out 
of the small door for the cage there. And, and the guy said, as I watched the rabbit, he started looking around. It was an unfamiliar area. He stood out there just outside of the cage. In front of him was all the freedom of the woods where it was natural for him to, to live. He said, and to my amazement, that giant rabbit turned around and squeezed itself back into the cage. It would not leave the cage because all that rabbit knew as reality was a cage. That's all it knew. And guess what? That's how people can be too. The only thing I know is what has locked me in. And so you hear the gospel and you say, that's too good to be true. And Paul said, that's how the Gentiles live in an imaginary world, in the futility of their minds. They're devoid of truth and their understanding, he said, is darkened. They live in futility. They're ignorant. They're without truth. There's a willful hardening within them. They surrender themselves to the darkness. They remain in sin. He says in verse 18 that the result is they're alienated from the life of God. The word alienated means to be cut off. They're estranged from fellowship with God and intimacy with him. You see, without their sins being forgiven, they live without God's presence. They have no knowledge of him. They don't know his goodness. As a matter of fact, they're hostile against him. In Romans 8, verse 7, it says the sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So they're in a constant state of, of hostility, of warfare, he says, a person who doesn't know the Lord. And the result is that without God, they remain alienated from him and spiritually blind. He goes on in verses 18 into verse 19 and speaks of the hardening of their heart, their past feeling. So they become spiritually and morally calloused. They're hardened. They're, they're covered with calluses. And, and, and calluses make you unable to feel. In other words, they become insensitive. They, they're spiritually dull. Their conscience does not bother them. And how many people have we met or perhaps we were like with no conscience, with no sense of doing something wrong? We may have hurt somebody who didn't bother us at all. We, we felt that they deserved it. They sh we should treat them that way because look at what they are like or what they've done to us. Well, that's what happens. There's a hardening, a callousness that takes place. It makes us insensitive to, to feeling. We, we're insensitive to pain. And, and Paul uses that in a spiritual sense, and he says they're dull spiritually. Their conscience simply doesn't bother them. They become indifferent to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's like what he said in 1 Timothy 4, verse 2, where they speak lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Callousness develops over time. It doesn't bother them anymore. If you continue to sin, sin just doesn't impact you the way that it one time did. Isn't that true? It is true. You did something that you were told not to do. The first time you did it, conscience bothered you. You knew it was wrong. Could have hurt people. Could have hurt your parents. Could have hurt your friends. Could have hurt somebody. You knew that. You felt bad about it. You did it. Then you did it again. It was a little easier the second time. Then you did it again. And before you know it, it became a habit. It became what you do. Our, our bodies sometimes tell us um, what we're doing isn't good for us. Our bodies will tell us that. Our conscience does too. I don't know about you. I used to smoke, and, and that, that's maybe surprising to some, but I did. I started smoking when I was seven or eight years old. And so my mom used to give me a quarter to go to the store down the street to buy cigarettes. And, it, you know, she's, she smoked a certain brand. I won't mention the brand. And I started just making my own notes at nine, ten years old, Cigarettes were a quarter at that time. And I'd go and buy a pack for myself, seven, eight years old. And I kept smoking for many years. But I can tell you this, I smoked camels, you know. Oh, and they tasted like a camel. I, I, I don't... <laughs> but the first time I took a hit off a camel and actually inhaled, my whole body said, you know, danger, Will Robinson. This is not a good thing for you to do. You know, <coughs> 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 anyway, you can get used to things if you really want to, can't you? 
I got used to smoking. I started smoking Pall Malls, and I'll, I don't want to be an advertisement for a bunch of cigarette brands, but I, they were normally unfiltered, and I, and I, I just one after, I was a chain smoker, especially when I was drinking. I just one after another, after another, after another. You become insensitive after a while. It doesn't bother you. You get used to it. Same is true with alcohol. You ever drink bourbon? The first time you ever had bur bourbon, whiskey, whatever, something hard. You know, what happened to your body the first time you drank that? Oh, oh your, ugh, ah, it burns. After a while, don't even notice it. Why? Because you become callous to it. You become used to it. In the world, we call it getting sophisticated, but in reality, it's getting hardened. It's becoming jaded. First time you did something you knew you shouldn't do, it was shame. You were embarrassed. You didn't want people to know. But after a while, it became your lifestyle. That's sin. That's what Paul says happens. You become indifferent. You become used to it. And he said, that's how the world lives. And that's absolutely true. And I'm going to give you some ancient history. It'll take me a moment. I don't even know if there's anybody in here. I'm pretty sure as I look out there are some. Now as I look out there, I see some gray hair. So um, there was a show that used to be, it was called Ed Sullivan. How many? Just, I just want to know how many. See, a lot of you don't know. Ancient history. Let me give you a history lesson. Ed Sullivan show was a big show. You know, when we grew up on television, you got you to gotta remember that. When we grew up, you know, we didn't have color TV until 62 or 63, we actually had to go to my aunt's house to watch color TV. We didn't have color TV. And a big TV was 19 inches. It was a 19-inch color TV, amazing. And we went there to see the Beatles when they were on the Ed Sullivan Show, so ancient history. But let me give you some things. There used to be on television, again, this will be like, no, you're a liar, shut up. There were censors. There were censors who would determine the words that could be spoken on television. Did you know that? There were censors, and they were called that, censors. And they would determine which words could be spoken on television um, and what kinds of things could take place. Some of you have heard of Elvis Presley. Some of you have. Um, when Elvis Presley was on Ed Sullivan, he was shown from the waist up because he shook his hips. So if you saw him on TV, all you saw was his waist up. You didn't see his, <laughs> you didn't see that. You just saw him from the top up, you know, because they thought that was provocative. There was a, a group that I used to like, you know, fast forward a few years, called The Doors. And The Doors had a song called Light My Fire. Oh, yeah, that was, about, that was about dope. That was about smoking marijuana. Light my fire. Anyway, um, <laughs> and in the song, he says, girl, we couldn't get much higher. Well, and so what did they say? They said, higher, the word higher cannot be used on TV. He did it anyway. He never was invited back, as I remember. Then you had another group, another ancient song, the Rolling Stones put out, let's spend the night together. But the censor said, you cannot say spend the night together. And so it's kind of, I've seen this, you know, uh, I've seen this where Mick Jagger, the lead singer, uh, had to sing, let's spend some time together. And you'll see him. I mean, the, 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 the camera takes a real close-up of him, and he kind of rolls his eyes like, are you kidding me? I have to say, let's spend some time together instead of let's spend the night together, okay? Now, the reason I say that is because this kind of thing today causes people to laugh. Why? I'll tell you why. Because as a society, we're calloused. We're calloused. We became calloused. We just don't realize it. We think that we're that it was more we're more sophisticated. No, we're not. We have gone down. The word blush, you don't use that word anymore. Why? Because nobody does. There are the things that used to make you blush with embarrassment, you're proud of now for doing. And we know that. I won't go into this too much, but look at the parades that we have today. 
Look at the people we applaud and say they're great because they're so brave. What has happened, guys? Exactly what the Bible says. They are past feeling. That's called walking in darkness. That's called walking in darkness. And what has happened is even the church has gotten used to the dark. Because if you stay in dark long enough, your eyes kind of get used to it. And after a while, you begin to think that's normal. When in fact, we're supposed to be walking in the light. Our light is to shine so that people will see our good works and glorify our Father who's in heaven. That's the kind of life the believers live. See, and so Jesus was speaking about that, and Paul was speaking of that too. The hardened hearts uh, speaks of a, uh, a lack of a sensitive conscience. And, and we have, we become insensitive towards right, towards wrong, and, and many people simply do what they please. There is no sense of shame or guilt, no remorse. We think it's normal. And, and that is a sign that we're in the last days. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 4, Paul said, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's today. That's what we have. That is the result of moral callousness. And this is walking in the dark. And finally, in verse 19, uh, Paul said they've given themselves over to licentiousness. He says they embrace a life devoid of moral restraint, a life given over to licentiousness, speaks of sexual promiscuity. By giving into a life of sin, there's a callousness and a loss of ability, as mentioned a moment ago, to blush. There's no understanding of simple modesty. There's no developed sense of right or wrong. Without the word, they define a code for themselves that accepts what pleases them. And that's why sometimes even believers get upset at Bible studies. <laughs> because they're convicted, because they choose to live a life that's really more celebrating dark than light, and then they get upset at you because of that. And so that's how it works. In John 3.19, Jesus said this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So Jesus is saying, follow me. If you follow me, your life will be set apart in an obvious way. And the quality of your life demonstrates your relationship to him. In 1 John 2, verse 6, it says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And so that's your introduction. Let's get into verse 13 back in John chapter 8. So as Jesus is speaking, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. So they don't respond to what he is saying. What they're actually doing is locking their attention on what would be called a technicality. So they say, you're bearing witness of yourself, and that isn't permitted under the law of Moses. In Deuteronomy 19.15, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. He goes on to say, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So they're saying, you're bearing witness of yourself, so your personal witness doesn't count. Well, in verse 14, Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I come from, came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone but I'm with the Father who sent me. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two is true. Well, I'm one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So he alludes to the law that I just read to you out of Deuteronomy, but he's making it very clear that his witness is sufficient. 
Why? Well, because he says, I'm in relationship with God. I came from God. I'm returning to God. So you can't say this. You can't say this kind of thing yourself because you don't have a relationship with God. But Jesus says, I can say that because I came from him. And the second thing in verse 15, he's saying, you're judging according to the flesh. In other words, you're using a carnal standard of judgment. Because he could be saying, I, because I, I appear to be only a man by appearances alone, you think I'm only a man. And again, people still quite naturally use fleshly standards of judgment. They do often judge based on outer appearance or what suits their particular opinion. And, and they don't have an outside standard that teaches them what is right and what is wrong. You know, that's what we believers have, by the way. We, we have an outside testimony. It's called the Bible. And, and I don't know how long you've been a Christian. You can fill that answer in for yourself, how long you've been a believer. But I can tell you that when I got saved, prior to coming to Christ, I had a moral code that had been established over the 20 years of life that I had lived, which included an information concerning the Ten Commandments and things like that. So there was a, a simple moral basis of my beliefs. Whether I was true to those beliefs is a different question, but I had them. So I knew it was wrong to steal. I knew it was wrong to kill and things like that because of the Ten Commandments. I, I knew this was a moral standard. And, and my generation, by the way, by and large, adhered to those things as being the rights and the wrongs of a society. That's how you come to know what is true. That's what you come to know what is right, what is wrong. That's how your conscience is informed. You see, your conscience can't save you. It can accuse you or excuse you, but it can't save you because your conscience is simply the, the, <laughs> the ethics that you own that are based on the things you've learned through experience and through study. And so your conscience may permit you to do things that the Bible forbids. Your conscience may permit you to live with someone. Why? Because we're in love. And what does that piece of paper got to do with love? Your conscience permits that. And so when somebody whose conscience doesn't, because Scripture teaches about fornication, adultery, and, and sexual sin and all, and we are informed by Scriptures about that, when we say, but it's wrong for you to do that, that's why people will get upset. Well, what right do you have to judge me? Why? Because they're callous, because they have taken upon themselves a moral code that resists what Scripture teaches. That's how it works. And so people can become callous to the truth Sometimes because they don't know it, and sometimes because they simply reject it. And so what happens is when you get saved and you begin to read the Word, you begin to develop a moral, a moral standard, and you no longer use fleshly standards of judgment. And moral discernment is an important aspect of your spiritual maturity. I can mention a moment ago it's an important part of society because unbridled tolerance results in moral anarchy. So we need to have standards, and, and Jesus is saying, well, you're judging me according to the flesh. But he goes on to say, I judge no one. The way you're judging me is with malice and ignorance. I, I don't judge in that manner. And yet, verse 16, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I'm not alone, but I'm with the Father who sent me. So my judgments are in complete harmony with my father. In John 5, 30, he said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous. Why? Well, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the father who sent me. So you guys are judging me by a different standard. You're not really looking at what scripture says concerning Messiah. He moves on in verse 17. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So if you appeal to the law of Moses, my words still remain true. I have my witness, and I have my Father's witness. And my Father's witness matters. My Father has witnessed concerning me. When you remember Mark chapter 9, verse 7, uh, at the transfiguration, 
uh, it says a, a cloud came, overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. That's the testimony of the father. In John 5, 37, Jesus said, the father himself who sent me has testified of me. So there's your testimony. You require a testimony, my father has testified concerning me. Well, this is what gets them upset, verse 19. Where is your father? They said to him. <laughs> Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you'd known me, you would have known my father also. And so, as he's speaking there, they ask, and I'll look at this with you for a moment. They ask him, where's your father? Now, that may be sarcasm, simple sarcasm. Why? And here's something you need to remember. Jesus had the reputation of being born out of wedlock. Where is your father? Would be a kind of a snide thing to say because just remember what had happened. His mother Mary had left Nazareth for a while, visited her cousin Elizabeth. She was betrothed to be married to Joseph and under Jewish law, was recognized as his wife already, though they hadn't consummated it with a ceremony or, or intimacy. But they regarded the betrothed woman as being married. She had left, and she had gone to visit her, her cousin Elizabeth and had come back pregnant. Now, when you think of Nazareth, don't think of a big city. Think of a village. There are commentators who say that the city of or the village of Nazareth may have had 60 people or so. It wasn't a huge city by any means. There weren't a lot of huge cities. It was a small village, 60 people. Some commentators say more than 100, but many of them say less than 100. So kind of think about that for a minute here and, and ask yourself if you were in a village of around 60 to 100 people, well, don't they know your business? They're gonna know your business because it's a small village, you know? So if you're in a small village, they may say, man, you haven't been sleeping well. And you say, how do you know that? Oh, your light's on most of the night. How do you know that? You staring at my house? Yeah, I'm not sleeping well either, you know? <laughs> so you know everybody's business, you really do. You know, and that's how it was. And so, so they knew. Mary's not married, and look at her. You know, she's, she's gaining weight. Mm hmm And that's a fact. So that was inside the village gossip. The village gossip. Yeah, Mary, Mary got pregnant out of wedlock, you know, and... Later on, she went on down to Bethlehem, came back with a baby a couple of years later. They all knew. They all knew what, what, what had taken place. So <laughs> they're asking a question that's probably sarcastic and a little, little snide, if you will. Uh, yeah. Who's your daddy? That's what they're saying. In John 8, 41, they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. That gives you insight that how Jesus was treated. And I love to say this at this time here, whenever I talk about Mary and what happened and all of that. Keep this in mind. She lived with that shame herself, the woman, an innocent woman lived with that shame for 33 years because Jesus was crucified at the age of 33. She lived with a shame for 33 years. And you know what saved her reputation? His resurrection. That's what saved her, res her, her reputation. Now again today, uh, I, I realize that this is kind of like for some people to say, well, that's another one of those things that's so different today. I, I get it. And there, there was a time when it, it was really an embarrassment wrong and even regarded by society as, as a sin. 
when someone would become pregnant out of wedlock. Of course, it's different now, right? I mean, you see birth announcements, you know, you know, you know, John Jones and Sylvia Smith uh, announced the birth of their baby, and 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 there's no shame at all related to that. During the time of Christ, and for, even in my lifetime, it was shameful. And she lived under that reputation to the point where even later on in the same chapter, they're going to say, we weren't born of fornication. And that, again, was a way of slamming Jesus Christ. Where is your father? And Jesus answered in verse 19, you know neither me nor my father. If you'd known me, you would have known my father also. So Jesus makes it clear that the Father is known only to those who receive Jesus. And he says, if you, if you don't know me, you don't know the Father who sent me. That's a very important point, by the way. To know Jesus is to know the Father. Uh, in, in 1 John 2, 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has a Father also. The Bible makes it very clear that if Jesus isn't your Savior, God is not your Father. And so when we have, and even Christians, I've, I've, had them, I've heard them argue, um, well, you know, at least they're worshiping God after their own way or their own God. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. See, again, I came out of the hippie background and all of that, you know, where we said it's a brotherhood of man and, and we're all sons of God. We referred to ourselves as that, you know, a child of God, I'm a child of God. We, we had songs that sang that, you know, Woodstock, you know, by um, Johnny Mitchell. Johnny Mitchell, you know, I came across a child of God. He was walking down the road. That's how we spoke of ourselves. We were, we're all children of God. God is our Father, but the Bible doesn't teach that. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe in his name. That's what the Scripture teaches. And so Jesus is making it very clear, if God were your father, you'd recognize who I am. Seeing that you don't recognize who I am, God is not your father. In verse 20, these words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. The treasury was located in, it, when you look at a map of the temple area, it was divided into four, four courts, and one of the courts was called the Court of the Women. In the Court of the Women were 13 trumpet-shaped chests they use those to collect the alms. And so that's where he was in the treasury area, in the court of the women. And it says that they were restrained from taking him. Why? It was not his time. It says in verse 20, these words, Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. No one laid hands on him. His hour had not yet come. Then, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, I'm going away and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I, am, where I go, you cannot come. And the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, you're from beneath, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so Jesus said, I'm going to go away. In other words, you claim to be looking for or awaiting Messiah, I'm going to die. I'll return to my father. Yet you still will reject me even after my resurrection. And in rejecting me, you're going to die unforgiven in your sins. You will not enter the kingdom. Well, when he says that in verse 22, they're saying, well, will he kill himself? This again may be a bit of sarcasm because they believe suicide resulted in eternal judgment. And so they're actually being sarcastic. He says, where I go, you cannot come. In other words, why would we want to follow you to hell? Suicide results in eternal judgment. So they're being sarcastic. And so he goes on in verse 23, you're from beneath, I'm from above, you're of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. You belong to this world. You make judgments based on your carnal understanding. Because of this, you're blind to who I am, and you reject me. You're at war, like it says in Romans 8, 7 and 8. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The carnal mind is hostily opposed to the things of God. If God says it's black, they say it's white. If God says it's sweet, they say it's sour. If God says it's up, they say it's down. That's what we do. We're hostile. We're opposed to him. That's what we are by nature. 
If a sign says, don't walk on the grass, we lay on the grass, they have a picture of us taken there on the grass. That's what we do. We have had rebellion. And so he's making it very clear that uh, there's no way you can be pleasing to God because you're in opposition. And so they go on to say, who are you? Verse 25. And Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I, I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They didn't understand that he spoke to them of the Father. And so who are you? Why are you making these claims? And he answers, I have consistently made it very clear, but you have consistently rejected me. I'm the light of the world, but you love darkness. And in verse 27, well, they didn't understand it. He was speaking to them of the Father, and that's because they walk in darkness. They're spiritually blind. There, there may be times when you've shared with people the faith of the Lord. You may be sharing the gospel to them, and, and you give them all kinds of information and lots of scriptures, and you're certain that you've convinced them, and yet they still reject. I've had a few conversations in my day with people, uh, some who have been from a, you know, a religious cult uh, and all, and I've, I've given them scriptures, especially at the beginning of my walk when I was learning things about the Lord and would share with people who were sharing with me. And, and, and I'd say, surely this argument will help them to see. And I, I would tell them something and, and expect that they would see. But the bottom line is, I had to learn 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, where Paul said, even if our gospel's veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine on them. You can argue with a person all day long, and you can have all the right answers and be able to supply the right responses, but it takes the Holy Spirit's conviction to awaken a person to sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the best I can do is sow seeds. You know, one man sows seed, another one waters, but God brings the increase. And as long as you understand that, and that's what's taking place. And then finally, he goes on to say, verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. When, I, when I'm crucified, after my resurrection, who I am will be abundantly clear. Because if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Um, the cross is that magnet that attracts the attention of man. And that's why we preach Christ crucified. That's why we speak of Jesus dying on the cross for us. And one of the things you might want to do, it's not hard to do, is read the book of Acts. Not every word, but every sermon. There's several sermons in it. And you can find the sermons in Acts pretty easily. There's several of them, but not so many that you couldn't do that in one sitting. And I want you, if you do it, I would like you to look and see what the messages were centered on. The messages that you hear in the book of Acts, all these early messages, was on Jesus dead, buried, and resurrected. That was, that is, the center of the gospel, Jesus dead, buried, and resurrected. And so Paul would speak that when he preached. He gave that message when he preached. Why? The apostle Peter would do the same. Why? Because that's how you're saved. And so you preach the gospel. And as you preach concerning who Christ is and what Christ has done, God, the Holy Spirit, convicts the heart of the hearer. And very often that person can be brought to faith in Christ. And it says in verse 30, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Now, people don't get saved because of somebody's testimony. I, I, I'll close with this. This just happened this week, this illustration. I was just sharing it with my staff yesterday how somebody wrote on Facebook. Facebook, I, you know, I know old people use Facebook. I'm one of the old people. And um, somebody wrote and said something uh, about testimonies. And as they wrote concerning testimonies, 
they said, don't be giving your testimony, give the gospel. It's just, a, just an exhortation. And, and so people begin to respond as they do. That's what Facebook's for, right? Converse and talk and all of that, and that's what they do, and to argue. And um, so a few people wanted to post. And, um, well, you know, testimonies are good and, and, and helps people to identify and, and, and I get it. I understand that. I'm, I'm not going to argue with it. That's true. I mean, um, that's true. It helps people to, to put flesh, we'll say, to, to the message. God says he saves. I've been saved. This is where I was. This is where I'm at. Yeah, I see how that works. I'm not opposed to that at all. And yeah, Paul, on a few occasions, spoke concerning what he was like. He gives his testimony several times. In the book of Acts, no less than three times, he does so in First Timothy and other places. And he'll make mention of what he was and all of that. I get it. But I said this, and I said, you know, testimonies. When Paul, there's nothing wrong with them, but when Paul was talking to Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, preach the gospel. He didn't say, Timothy, give your testimony. I said, I've, I've given over 8,000 Bible studies, over 8,000 Bible studies. I have probably studied the Bible no less than 32,000 hours, no less than that in my life probably more, 8,000 Bible studies at least, over 32,000 hours of study, and I have never seen anybody get saved by my testimony, but I have seen many people saved by the gospel. So you preach the gospel. You share what Jesus did, how he died, why he died, how he was resurrected, because that's what they call the crux of the matter. The word crux is the cross. That's the center of the matter. We preach Christ crucified, dead, buried, but alive. And it's in the preaching and the teaching, and we just read it, and we'll look at this again next time we're together a little bit further. They believed in him because of what he said. The gospel message, the teachings of Christ, and the church, by the way, is getting away from the gospel. We're getting caught up with entertainment because we realize, pastors like myself realize that people would rather play with their, their electronic devices than to listen to a message. But guess what? The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most exciting, real thing you could embrace. And that changes lives. And that's what happened when Jesus was speaking. They listened to him and many believed in him because of what he said. That's the gospel. And Father, we thank you.